Good morning. If you take your seat, we'll get going in our last session. One last blessing, a few moments of one last blessing before we all head home to the people and the places that God has given us to care for, the people and the places that God has called us to. But a few thanks uh, are in order before we, uh, before we get going. And one thanks we've already done, and that's to the staff of the Regency. And a next thanks is to Christine Day and Amy McCausland, uh, Andrew Kutzier and Christine Tan particularly. They've just d demonstrated amazing administrative leadership to make this thing happen. Would you join me to thank them? Uh, it's also appropriate to thank uh, my colleagues at Trinity International University. We're privileged to be the host this year uh, for the summit and also especially for the summit uh, executive planning committee uh, who've labored on our behalf uh, for almost two years uh, since the last one. Our chair, Greg uh, Forrester, Al Arisman, Denise Daniels, Larry Ward, and Lisa Slayton, would you join me in thanking these friends? Just before we go, we thought we would uh, just gather a small group up here for some reflection time, uh, kind of join us uh, in reflecting back on uh, the few hours we've had together, uh, as well as remember that this conversation is one that is global. Uh, this is a conversation that is not just confined to this room at all, but the Lord is surely up to something, is he not? Uh, there's no other way to explain uh, the formerly disparate people groups and individuals and fellowships and denominations and you name it, that he seems to be drawing together somehow in his kindness uh, for these conversations and these activities and establishing the work of our hands. So to do that, I'd like to invite three uh, colleagues up on the stage with me. Uh, joining me will be Mark Green of the London Institute for Contemporary Christianity. Ebenezer Perrin Baraj of the Raba Institute in Chennai, India, and Susie Sang, who's an adjunct professor at our own Trinity International University. We'd planned for David Henry to join us, but unfortunately he had to catch an earlier flight than he anticipated back to Kingston, Jamaica. And I'd ask you to pray for David. Uh, for the last year, he's been on a national tribunal uh, that the Governor General has appointed to deal with uh, uh, just an incredibly bad vi uh, outbreak of violence in their country. David's a trained lawyer and has uh, been a pastor for many years now, and he's, uh, he's stewarding a very difficult task, and he had to return home earlier than he uh, anticipated to do that, or else he'd be with us as well, but pray for our, our brother. Interestingly, Susie, who will be joining me in the, on the dais here, is, uh, was a staff member at that same church, Swallowfield Chapel uh, in Kingston, and is a long, long uh, friend, family friend and colleague of David's, so it'll be great to have Susie up here. So while you friends come up and join me, I, I want to give you sort of a show and tell of what this global conversation looks like. At Trinity, we have several PhD programs, and I'm directing one of them these days in educational studies, and we have people come from around the world. And one of the brothers that came from around the world was a man named Sutrisna Harjanto, and Sutrisna was a trained pharmacist for many years, uh, practiced pharmacy in Indonesia. And then IFES, was on IFES staff for some 20 years in Indonesia, and then came to the States, to Trinity, uh, to study. And the first time we met, he came into my office and said, I have a burden for faith and work. I have a burden for whole life discipleship. Um, I hope I've come to the right place. I'm already here. Do you think you can help me? And I just said, it with God's help, I think so. Let's, let's try this. Let's do something together. Let's, let's study together. Let's learn from one another. He graduated a couple of years ago, and his dissertation was published by Langham. Listen to the title, The Development of Vocational Stewardship Among Indonesian Christian Professionals. This is a sign, isn't it? This is hope. This conversation is going to the ends of the earth and back. And we're all the ends of the earth, by the way. It's everywhere to everywhere now, isn't it? It always should have been, and now indeed it is. So as we, as we chat up here, we'll just be asking some simple questions about our reflections about the weekend, 
maybe some remaining challenges, um, and then also some perhaps some stories from these folks about uh, what's most encouraging about what they see that the Lord's doing around the world. So we'll just get started now and have a conversation. Listen in. Let me start with Susie. Thank you, sir. So what's the most encouraging thing you've heard uh, during the summit? Well, wow. Um, There's just a lot to process in terms of listening to workshops and plenaries and so on. But I think um, I categorize them in three ways. The first... The first area is, I think I hear a lot of hope. And we, we know that in this climate in the world today, hope is a very um, fleeting thing that we can capture. There's so much happening in the world, war everywhere, um, divisiveness and so on. I feel like we represent the lights of hope. Um, and I heard a lot of that throughout a thread of the workshops and a thread of all of the plenary sessions we named what needed to be named, but we also spoke hope as believers in Christ and knowing that we are the vessels of hope that can take that to the world. Hmm. Mark or Abby, jump in. Uh, encouraged to hear, uh, we are co-creators and stewards from Andy Mills. Uh, encouraged to hear, hear that we are sheep and shepherd. Encouraged to hear stories from people from various professionals, uh, various professions, uh, finance, medical, engineering, and how they integrate faith and work. Encouraged to hear stories from different city movements, Cincinnati, for example, Denver, Chicago, Nashville. Encouraged to hear some of the key points that I found in my research, treating people as image bearers helping people find meaning and purpose in workplace, learning in workplace, encouraged to see people from around the globe. I met a person from Hong Kong, a person from Australia, a person from Thailand. Mm. That's great. Mark? Um, well, I've seen your good deeds and your perseverance. I've seen your humility, your creativity, uh, your unity. And I've seen your miniature peanut butter Reese cups. Yes, <laughs> yes. And I have nothing against you. <laughs> um, I, I find this very moving, really. I'm, I, um, as a conference, I felt like, um, you know, the tone of this conference, the, the vulnerability of people, the lack of defensiveness, um, it's just fantastic. It feels like we don't have to pretend with one another about where we've got to mm -hmm. or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I found two particular things really encouraging. Right. Um, one was I, I went to the uh, first session, the Me Too mm -hmm. um, discussion. And I think what I found incredibly um, helpful about that, again, was the way the conversation happened. Mm -hmm. um, it just felt completely different from the way that that conversation happens in almost any other context. And if we are to be prophetic to the world, <laughs> we have to be prophetic with truth and the way that we have our conversations. Mm -hmm. And it just seems to be to me a model of grace mm. and truth spoken yeah, together. Praise the Lord. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> my, my other highlight mm -hmm. was actually, um, you know, obviously highlights are personal um, to some extent, and uh, was the, the first evening you talked about signs. Mm -hmm. And I'm always interested in when somebody seems to be doing something that just in a slightly different way that reflects something of God. So we had Andy Mills come up and he, and he talked about his company and uh, he used some language which I, I wrote down and went onto their website and I've now met three or four of their people. Um, and, he, and this is what's on their website. And he, he spoke it out, but I wrote it down so to remind you. Normally firms use human assets to achieve their purpose. For Archegos, our people are important, are an important part of our purpose. And then he talked about, uh, we aim to build convictions in people that when pursued with perseverance will add significant added value to firms at all levels. So what did I hear? Now, normally churches use human assets to achieve their purposes. Yeah. For the church of the future, mm -hmm. our people are, are an important part of our purpose. Are we trying to build convictions that when pursued with perseverance will add significant value to every workplace and every context? So what I heard was 
a disciple maker, trying to create a disciple making culture in a company. And it seems to me that the primary um, role of all Christians is to make disciples, whatever other role we mm -hmm. have. And so to hear somebody who was self-consciously thinking, this is what we're trying to do in this place. I've never heard that language like that before. And I, yeah. I thought, that's, a, that's good. I'm going to get his story. I'm going to write it. Uh -huh. I'm going to publish it. I'm going to make a million. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> In okay. the gig economy, because I, I don't know how else to make money. Exactly. Anymore. I'm going to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be okay. Why don't you keep going and, and say something about uh, some challenges, either particular or perennial challenges you're still observing in the movement? Um, um, I suppose, um, one, yeah, so um, the faith and work movement, um, I'm, you know, I'm a, just a been with it for a very long time, but I, I recognize that the question is for us who are in this movement is, what are we trying to do? What is it about? Um, and who, who are we in it? And it seems to me that what's shifted is that there's a general recognition now in the language that people are using that we are part of a whole life disciple making movement. The faith and movement, work movement, if it stays as a faith and work movement, will die because it, it, it will shear off away from the church, it will shear off away from other things. If it's just that, mm -hmm. if it's an expression of whole life disciple making, we're cooking on gas. Um, every pastor can theoretically up, si sign up to that. And so what I feel like where we've got um, more broadly and also in the language that's been used from the stage is that recognition that that's what we are now. So yes, we, we go... We, we do our specific things, whether it's executives or it's students or it's blue collar or whatever. We do our specific things for the workplace with gusto, but we know we need to change the bigger culture in order to do that. And that's a good place to be. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose the thing I'm yearning for is that other bit, which is the disciple making bit. Um, I think we've found uh, where we are that we can help people see the whole life bit, but the disciple making the intentional thing around making a disciple is different. So the Faith at Work movement now is brilliant, it seems to me, at giving people a vision of what, why work matters, why the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ thinks that's an important thing that, and walks with us. But actually, to be a disciple in the workplace takes more than a vision. We need to have the spiritual resources, the people behind us, the, under, the, the biblical uh, fueling day by day. We need, we need that to survive in toxic environments. In other words, we need to move on, not just from vision, but to the discipleship that was behind it. And we heard some of that here. So for me, it's like, wow, this is opening up and deepening and widening. So yeah. very encouraging. Thank you. How about you guys? I think um, some of the challenges that I continue to reflect on and think about are questions such as, what kind of theological and ecclesiological narratives do we co-sign on? Um, what do we believe about people who are made in the image of God? And how does that affect our faith at work? How do we see people both as individuals as well as part of communities? And which communities are included and which communities are excluded? And so asking those types of questions in our work context, but also in the context of whole life discipleship, how do we grow with and learn with, about, and from each other, not seeing that as a deterrent, but seeing that as a value added, seeing that as the conversation is not just in this room, but this conversation can go across borders and seas, but also the conversation can go down the street and which churches and how are churches partnering with one another to have these types of conversations, especially across ethnic lines. So I was very encouraged by some of the, the workshops that were focusing on specific areas. For example, I went to one on wealth creation in the African American community. And what does that mean for thinking about faith at work when opportunities are not present? 
So I think if we continue to deepen that conversation, to be vulnerable, to be humble, and to approach it in that way, I believe that there would be much more uh, generative conversations that can take us beyond um, ways that we, we are polarized or we can actually reflect a beloved community that God intends. Mm, thanks. Debbie? I think there are two uh, primary challenges uh, with regards to contextualizing this in India. So as Margaret said in 2010, the SSD, the sacred and secular divide, and uh, how am I going to you know, help people to come out of that? Mm -hmm. And then the second one uh, with regards to my context in India, faith at work in blue collar and service jobs. For example, the way janitors are considered here and the way janitors are considered in India, let alone how they are treated, uh, it's completely different. So uh, those are two challenges yeah. that I Thanks. Last question would be, uh, maybe we'll start back with you, Abby. Um, what's the most encouraging thing that you're witnessing these days about what God's doing in the world, uh, either at home or here? Or what's encouraging you about the, what, what the Lord is up to, as we mentioned earlier? Leslie Newbegin, uh, who labored in India, especially um, in the place where I come from, he said once, meaningful action in history is possible only when there is some vision of a future goal. Meaningful action in history is possible only when there is some vision of a future goal. My wife Esther, she's here, and uh, I am uh, part of the Trinity Evangelical Divinity School PhD Educational Studies Program, and um, we have a vision, and uh, we have established a network in India called RABA, Multiply, increase, abundance uh, in Hebrew. It's a nonprofit organization with a vision of multiplying redemptive influence. Uh, so we want to plant gospel-centered churches, collaborate with uh, like-minded organizations, and equipping gospel leaders across India. So my research is focused on church-based nonprofit organizations that focus on equipping people for whole life ministry. Right. And my wife's uh, interest is to study the impact of whole life discipleship in the lives of gospel leaders. So both are complementary studies. And God willing, we are uh, going back to India by May of 2020. And uh, we want to really implement what we are learning and what we are seeing here. And, and soon enough, their dissertations will be published by, by Langham as well. <laughs> Let us pray. Uh, Susie, how about you? Um, born and being born and raised in Jamaica, I was a part of a church and David was here for this uh, conference that had a value of faith at work. And so this has not, not been an abnormal concept for me, but um, churches in Kingston, uh, Kingston is a, a place of paradox. And so the questions that we're asking are, how do we live in the context of paradox and define work? What does work really look like in the context of um, places that have a lot of violence or persons out of jobs? Um, temporary or permanent joblessness. So I feel like the, the conversation at that level across cultures and in another context, um, I'm excited to see how we contextualize that for um, not only a Jamaican culture, but the Caribbean culture. And how does that then impact and connect with other um, people groups around the world? How do we speak a common language but also identify ourselves as this context is unique to us based on what's happening in our own country. How do we define work? How do we define jobs? What is defined as a job? And as Ebi rightly says, um, defining a janitor here is different from defining a janitor in India as well as in Jamaica. How do you do, do that well in ways that we can not just adopt all of the models here, but contextualize them so that they are relevant and they are able to be used in a way that our own people have their own agency to speak into that. Mm, thanks. Mark? Can I have two? Sure. Well, first of all, I'm always excited by hearing stories of uh, God, God at work in people. Yeah. In the end, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's it. Um, one of my favorites at the moment is a 19-year-old girl who just started. Is a 19-year-old is a girl? Have I just blown everything? Am I going to be thrown out? Not at all. Okay. A 19-year-old woman. Um, who's just started a job as a hairdresser, and she's in this for four weeks, and her pastor commissions her 
for this for this job. And it's quite stressful to begin with. It's her first, uh, uh, you know, full-time paid job. And uh, so I asked her in front of 300 people. So what difference does um, following Jesus make <laughs> to the way you wash someone's hair? What a r terrible question to ask someone. <laughs> Luckily, it was the Holy Spirit. And she said, well, she said, um, I pray for them as I massage in the conditioner. And I just thought, she's been working for a month. What kind of church sends a young person into their first job commissioned and knowing to pray for every single person that she touches, probably never knowing what will happen to that prayer, knowing that God is interested in that? I mean, it seems like a tiny thing, doesn't it? My, my big excitements, though, are about theological education mm. and the British church. I mean, who would have thought it? So theological education, um, uh -huh. first of all, when the Holy Spirit gets to work, um, he doesn't just work in one place, and I know that many good things are happening here through uh, Kern and Karam and all that kind of stuff. Uh, meanwhile, elsewhere in the world, uh, where we don't have the World Series. <laughs> Was that uh, a prayer request or something? No, no, no. <laughs> um, We've been working again with Langham for the last uh, two years, and we've been around four continents. Uh, we've been to uh, Asia, Singapore, and so on, working in workshops with 10, 10 um, uh, theological educators from each, from each region. And uh, th this, this month in Panama, for the first time ever, the International Council for Evangelical Theological Educators, it's a try on a conference, is taking on the issue of overcoming the sacred secular divide through theological education. I mean, and because of the work being done here and elsewhere, we have something to say. But if you'd said to most people, I think, in this movement, that a global consortium of theological educators would be saying, we have got to change the culture. And within that, some of the people, my favorite story of change was uh, from a guy called Dr. Edwin Tay, who is uh, in Singapore, who's the new principal there. And so we were talking to him, and he was saying, well, what I've done so far is this. I have a new administrator in my office, and as part of her induction, I gave her a one sheet of paper, a summary of the theology of work in week one, a one-page summary of ministry at work in week two, and a one-page summary of um, vocation in week three, all written, of course, by that great Australian, and there are lots of Australians here, as you know, uh, Robert Banks. And every week, we spent half an hour discussing them. My point about this story is, his reaction was not, now I'm gonna change every course here, and all that. His reaction was, it starts in my office. I'm gonna disciple mm. inside out. It's fantastic. And the second thing is the, the Anglican Church. And again, if you'd said this five years ago, we would not have believed it. So two years ago, this I think is the first denomination globally to take this really, really seriously. The Anglican Church is, um, we only have 5% of people going to church once a month or more in England. It's 46 here, 5%. If you want to be a missionary, come to England. Please come to England. Send all your people to England. Uh, we need some Americans in England. Please, I know we treat you badly, but please come. <laughs> 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 and um, so we wrote a report for the Archbishop, which, um, which was basically about setting God's people free. The Anglican Church has had 12 reports since 1946 about the liberation of the laity and nothing has happened. And the genius of the person who led this team um, said, we're gonna, get, we're gonna put a plan with it. He used to work for McKinsey, there you go. So we had a plan and the, the Anglican Church approved the plan, put money behind it, put this and that behind it. And then they said, we're gonna have some learning hubs. A diocese is a big area. Um, so they have 43 dioceses. And normally when you start a learning hub, it's a pilot program to learn how to, how do you create whole life lay disciples in a church that's never done it? That's what they're saying. We've never done this. This is not a theological or ecclesiastical issue. This is a culture issue. That's what they've understood. And normally four or five dioceses would sign up. Well, 25 out of the 43 signed up and about five or six others already working with us. In other words, about 70% of the Church of England is now focusedly trying to work out how to make whole life disciples for everyday life. I don't know if that's not God. Yeah. I don't know, it's unbelievable to me. Yeah. Great story, thank you. So I, I suppose one of our, one of our uh, personal, organizational, and corporate takeaways is who are our partners? Uh, who are your partners, as Susie said, across the street as well as across the world? 
uh, who could our partners be? Who could we lock arms with? Who could we uh, learn from? Uh, North Americans have lots to learn from brothers and sisters around the world, including uh, topics related to this movement. And it's, it's just an exciting time to be involved, isn't it, in God's kindness. Let me ask you a few questions as we get close to ending today. Where is God working? Where is gospel fruit being born? Where is God's blessing of restoration being witnessed? Where is God healing? Friends, don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. Let's remind one another to not lose heart. Our mighty God is on the move. Amen? Amen. All around his world. All around his world. Can we express our appreciation to our sister and brothers um, for their stories? Thank you, guys. Go ahead. And I'd like to invite Al Arisman uh, up to give uh, final tributes, actually, to two movement pioneers. Thank you. Someone asked me recently, what organization runs the summit? And where did it come from? In answering that question, I want to give tribute to two colleagues, David Gill and Bill Peel, and I want to tell a bit of their story. In 2012, when David was at Gordon-Conwell Seminary, a representative came to him and said, from the Kern Family Foundation, uh, we would like to um, offer some money to help grow this. What ideas do you have? He offered a few piddling things, and they said, think bigger. And he said, why don't we create a summit? But in creating a summit, he wanted to do it not about the faith and work movement as we know it, but about the faith and work movement as God knows it, which means look for the work that God is doing even among people that don't identify in this way. He wanted to include the blue collar workers, a movement that has been going since the 1930s. He wanted to include the African American church, which has been doing faith and work out of biblical faithfulness and economic necessity for decades. He wanted women and men, younger and older. Since I was teaching, co-teaching with David at Gordon-Conwell, he asked me if I'd help, and I said, sure, we had worked together for a while. And we had a doctoral student, Bill Peel, who had been working in this area for 25 years, and we together named ourselves the Organizing Committee. In 2014, we optimistically found a room for 225 people and said, let's see what happens. And a month before the meeting started, we cut off the registration and ended up with 280 people in that small space. David had a lot of innovations in this uh, first summit. He said, let's do TED-style talks so that we can hear from a lot of voices, not just a few. So we had pastors, both suburban and inner city. The church is an important part of the conversation. We had people from the boardroom, but a social venture from Yonkers, the orchards of eastern Washington, and inner city entrepreneurs. Many of the people that came to that first summit had never been at a Faith at Work conference before. The second innovation David asked is he said, we're not going to incorporate We'll let Gordon Conwell be the seminary host for that first one. We'll use their risk and their platform and run this and hope we break even. But we asked them to remain in the background. It's a big ask, and they did. He also wanted to include pioneers because we didn't start this, and people have been doing it for a long time. David was relentless in his detailed focus on that first meeting. And if you were at Boston in 2014, you saw the fruits of that work. And David, please stand up. We want to thank you. The next question we asked was, should that be a one-time thing, or should we keep it going? 
And Bill Peel answered that question by saying, I think we could do this through the Center of Faith and Work at Letourneau University. I think they would buy into this idea of supporting this whole thing and making it work, and Bill invested an incredible amount of time. He broadened the organizing team, and that conference in Dallas included a postmaster from India, a cupcake lady from Seattle, John Perkins from Mississippi, Catherine Alsdorf, a 20-something technology developer, again, many times, people not associated by their standard with the faith and work movement. Uh, the conference drew 400 people with 100 others streaming in. And Bill, you made that conference possible and you set the groundwork for doing this every two years. Let's thank Bill Peel. We owe a great deal to the insight that David and Bill brought to the Summit Foundation. What we learn is the faith and work movement did not start 20 years ago. None of us own it. None of us started it. But we are privileged to come alongside what God is doing from our own corners and to share as different members of the body of Christ with what he is doing in that corner. And the purpose of the summit has been and continues to be to allow us to get a glimpse of what God is doing. And now Greg Forrester and Trinity International University have carried this on in the same tradition, and we should thank Greg as well. Please thank him as he comes forward. And Al Sumat is to mention this, but he, of course, has been central to the summit all along as well. Would you please join me in honoring Al as well? <laughs> Brothers and sisters, it has been a joy and a privilege and an honor and a whole lot of fun and sometimes maddening to be with you at the summit. I have a couple of quick announcements before we close up. Uh, Sharon Schaefer, would you please stop by the registration desk on your way out? Sharon Schaefer, and also local folks, uh, please remember if you can find a fish that hasn't been taken yet, please feel free to take those fish home and give them a home and just keep swimming. Well, the word and spirit of God have done a great deal of work among us in the last two days, don't you think? Can I get an amen? I'm a Presbyterian, I'm not supposed to say, can I get an amen, but I'm going to do it this one time. The Word and Spirit of God have done a great deal of work among us, and we have been privileged, all of us, to be a part of that. Well, as you've heard, the summit moves from institution to institution every two years, uh, and Trinity International University has been delighted to be a part of that, uh, but we will now pass the ball. Uh, it's my responsibility to tell you that relying on the Lord's grace, the organizing committee of the Faith and Work Summit is already in uh, discussions with uh, potential future hosts. The Lord has not yet brought those decision-making processes to a close. We continue to rely on the Lord. We heard on Thursday evening that you don't build a tower without counting the cost. We want to make sure that everything is in place before we make decisions. So we want you to know, though, that the organizing committee is not asleep on getting the 2020 Faith and Work Summit put together, and the Lord is instructing us that we are to wait on him, so we're going to wait on him a little more, but we're optimistic, and we rely on him. So mark your calendars for fall of 2020. Watch your email inboxes. If you are not on the summit's email list, uh, if you uh, came in without going through the whole registration, just make sure that we have your email and watch your inbox. We will be announcing when we have something to announce about the location of the 2020 Faith at Work Summit. In the meantime, there are tons of ways to stay engaged and continue to be a part of the movement. The, uh, all the plenary sessions from this summit have been video recorded. Uh, and with the Lord's help, we are going to get all the videos of all the plenary sessions onto the summit's YouTube channel. Uh, just as soon as we can. And of course, uh, as Mark Green just mentioned, there are many other places uh, where you can get connected. Uh, he was kind enough to mention my event, Karam Forum, which of course you should all come to. You're very welcome. We'd love to have you. And Mark will be speaking, which I'm sure had nothing to do with his mentioning it. 
But it's January 3 to 4 in Dallas, and we have a special uh, coupon at the booth, so stop by the booth if you want to hear more from Mark Green, David Miller, and a diverse array of other speakers. And now, as my final responsibility as the chair of the Summit Organizing Committee for the 2018 Summit, I'm deeply honored to invite a personal hero of mine to come up and say a word of benediction as we close. Would you please welcome Rich Mao? Wow, this has been an amazing experience. I've been called a lot of things, but I think it's the first time I've ever been called a pioneer. And uh, I'm humbled to uh, be in the lineup with so many wonderful people in the past who have contributed so much to the faith and work movement. Uh, but, but I've had a kind of pioneer feeling here the last couple of days. I feel like uh, somebody who uh, was sent out to the wilderness to find a place where people might settle, and then 100 years later to come back and see the city that was built. And uh, this has been such a rich experience. I've learned a lot the last couple of days, and I've been so inspired and so grateful to God for the, the complexity, the enthusiasm, the, the, the robust theological explorations that have been uh, on display here at this wonderful summit. It's just been a terrific thing. Uh, we're right to think that we aren't initiating this thing, uh, even those of us, I remember Pete Hammond and others, and we used to sit around and gripe about why evangelicals don't get excited about this stuff, but we ourselves were inspired by things from the past. Uh, I personally learned a lot from a wonderful document at the Vatican II Council of the Catholic Bishops. You can find it online, the Apostolate of the Laity, which is really a, a very profound statement. But I have to mention, uh, because no one else has that I, I know of at this conference, uh, I was very much inspired by Abraham Kuyper, the great uh, Dutch theologian of the 19th century, who also served as prime minister of the Netherlands, who organized the uh, labor workers, who organized Christian farmers, federations, uh, art guilds, and uh, his most famous statement uh, that everyone, if you don't know anything else about him, you ought to know this one, that there is not one square inch of the entire creation about which Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all, does not cry out, this is mine, this belongs to me. Every square inch, every, every square inch of every stadium, every office building, every classroom, every cruise ship on every level, all of those square inches belong to Jesus Christ. Now there's a danger in that kind of proclamation because we can easily hear that it's saying, okay folks, let's go out and, and conquer every one of those square inches in the name of Jesus. And so I have relied heavily on a kind of Mother Teresa corrective to all of that, that on many of those square inches, lepers are dying and need to hear whispers of the love of Jesus and concern for God's people. We need to go out and, and go to those square inches where immigrant children are crying out for their parents and where people are grieving and people are crying and people are under the yoke of, of oppression. It's so important for us uh, not just to go out in triumph, but to go out and be willing to suffer alongside of people who are struggling with the hopes and fears of all the years that we know are met in Jesus Christ. And so we turn to Jesus uh, at the end of all of this. Uh, will, you, will you sing with me? He is Lord, He is Lord, He is risen from the dead, He is Lord. He is Lord, He is Lord, He is risen from the dead, and He is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue come that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, sisters and brothers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we receive uh, the words of a benediction that we've already heard this morning, and we need to hear again. And may the God of peace, 
who was brought again from the dead, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, the blood shed once for all on Calvary, make each of us equipped for every good work, for good work, to do his will, to do that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit and to Jesus Christ be honor and glory and majesty and power both now and forevermore and all God's people say, amen. amen.